Brilliant. He's been writing it for 18 years after a career managing top class hotels all over the world. He's been chairman of ISIC, the Irish Tourism Industry Confederation. He's now on the board of Fortune Ireland and he's going to tell us how you create a number one visitor attraction. Thank you, Vivian. Good morning, everybody, and thank you to the National Tourism Forum for the invite today. I have something in my head, and it's been there for years, but uh, tourism equals access, access equals tourism. But after today, I'm going to build on another bit to that saying, carry equals tourism, tourism equals carry, because I think you guys really get tourism, and you do it. And the fact that you're putting on this, this is, I believe, the second year of it, to show the commitment to tourism. So again, thank you very much. How did we get to that? Um, so I just want to share with you that this was, I don't know if you can read that, but this was the vision that Guinness had for the Guinness Stores back in 1995-96. So they had a plan to spend 42 million on, on a brand centre, not a tourist attraction, a brand centre that would be a vehicle to bring people closer to the brand and help sell uh, Guinness sales around the world. And we opened in the year 2000, and though I just took some of the bullet points from there, that we would deliver a million visitors, we'd make people feel close to the band, it would be a great representation of who Guinness and Viaggio were in Ireland, we would be best practice in the industry, and we would support the overseas markets in the sales of Guinness. And actually, every one of those are a tip of the box, which I'm delighted to say has happened. But it was very brave of Viaggio to spend 42 million. They could have built a brewery, at that stage in Africa, which would have had a far quicker return. And I thought it was very brave to build it, but they saw the potential of having a great brand home. And why they did it was, Guinness is a genuinely iconic international brand. And it's sold in 150 countries, it's brewed in 60. We sell more Guinness in Africa than we do anywhere in the world. We have three massive breweries in Nigeria, Ghana, and Cameroon, which are as big as St. James's Gate. It's a different Guinness, it's in a bottle, it's beautiful, drink it from a fridge like you drink wine, you sip at it, and it's a fabulous Guinness if you ever get a chance to do it. But that's why they built, and also at that time, when I joined the company, I left hotel management, came to Guinness in 19, uh, 1999, and at that time, a lot of the older Guinness adorers were literally dying, and they weren't, we weren't getting the recruitment and the adopters coming on, on stream, and so Guinness wanted to represent itself at that time about in, in terms of recruitment and all that. So it was seen as an old man's drink. Uh, it was seen that the young people would say, young people of legal drinking age, I might say, would say things like, when I get to, like my father one day, I'll drink a Guinness. And of course, a brand would die if you allowed that to continue. So the Guinness storehouse was set up as part of that change. We wanted people to leave the Guinness store as saying, wow, I didn't know Guinness was like that. So that was part of the, of the plan of that. One of the key things we've done is that we've landed on a brand purpose. And actually, I think that's really important for any business, you know, that this is really our North Star. It's where we question ourselves on our recruitment and our investment in the product and all of that. You know, we exist. Our whole purpose is to bring people on an unforgettable journey right into the heart of the brand. And we challenge ourselves on, on, on a weekly and a monthly basis on that, and particularly when it comes to strategic decisions about where we want to go next with the Guinness Storehouse. This is what I arrived at. I, I was managing a beautiful five-star hotel in Saudi Arabia, and I came over and I was confronted with this a building site with engineers and architects and loads of Guinness uh, marketing directors and all that sort of stuff. But that was it. I was on my own. So where did I start? And uh, actually, the funny thing is, the very first person I recruited <coughs> was the canteen manager in Guinness. Cindy Martin, who it turns out was a Shannon graduate and had loads of experience. And I, actually, when I was discussing with her, I knew she had great people skills and all that. So I made an immediate connection. And she was the very first person who came on board with me. So I think one of the things we got right at the beginning, and I'm very pleased to say, is that um, we got the story right. We got the heart of the story right. And I think that was the really important thing. We could have been distracted and concentrate on the outer here, which is the architecture and the design. And if you think about running hotels, that's, you spend a lot of time in designing, don't you? The corridors and the bedrooms and all that sort of stuff. But with the Guinness Storehouse, there was the one thing we got really right, was making sure we had a great story to tell, and we dialed up the fantastic history, heritage, and philanthropy of this wonderful brand that we own. 
and, um, and, and create an emotional aspect of it. And to do that is quite difficult because the architects always win, if you allow them to. Architects will always win in, when you have that tension between architecture and creativity. So on the left hand side here, uh, communion, goodness and power. These are the attributes of Guinness and have been for years. So that was a great starting point. So when we brought in the creative people to overlap the architectural work, we said to them, look, whatever we do has to reflect the, the attributes of the brand. So communion means conversation. It means this fun and crack and all that sort of stuff. And boy, we need that nowadays. I've seen somebody this morning, we're all on our phones all the time, our computers. So there's more and more a need for us. There's nothing nicer than having a great conversation over a pint of Guinness, in my opinion. I just think it's quite special and unique. And then the goodness, you know, the goodness and the quality that we design, that we spend looking after the brand, and the power. So, for example, in the welcome area, we have a massive waterfall, which is about 30, 40 feet high, which shows you the power of the brand and all of that. So every floor was then themed out. We brought in uh, um, a company from America to help us to tell that story and to make sure we themed it all very, very well. Um, big challenge for me was to make it a fun experience. Uh, one of the things that I would, it could very easily have happened at Guinness Stores is that we could have become a shrine or a temple to the brand. Um, I remember once visiting Intel and uh, you always had to take your shoes off and not speak when you went into the brand home over in San Jose. It was that, and, and that's the very opposite of what we wanted <coughs> because let's face it, we sell Guinness and uh, our purpose within Diageo, one of our brand purposes, is to celebrate life every day, everywhere. So if we're in the fun and entertainment business, we better make sure that the, the Guinness Storehouse is a fun and engaging experience. So there's always, again, that healthy tension between being on brand, representing the brand, but every touch point had to be fun and engaging. <coughs> Sorry, just take a sip. Um, I just want to show this, very relevant to the conference here today. A big uh, contributor to our success was Plugging into tourism, I remember the first week I arrived, I invited a gentleman called Alan Glenn, who was the chairman of the ITOA at the time, and I brought him into the director's dining for lunch. And some of the directors get said, Paul, who's that? And I said, he's Alan Glenn, a very important man of tourism. And I was like, hmm, yeah, I couldn't understand that. The reason I say this is that uh, this is where we went from being a brand experience to plugging into tourism to create the numbers, because guess what? Tourists have mouths and they eat and drink, and they are also our consumers when they go back to their home country. And I think now, after 18 years, the penny has dropped with Guinness and Billy. <laughs> yes, tourists are very important to tourists. So we decided then we'd take a leading role in tourism, not just be there, but we'd also support. So I think Mark and Paul will agree, and Fiona, and anybody that's in it, that if a phone call comes into the Guinness store has about support and tourism, the answer is always yes, you know. Even if we don't have bananas, we say, yes, we have no bananas. <laughs> so the answer is yes, all the time. So it's that uh, positive attitude to supporting tourism. And, and also taking part in it. Now, that's why I enjoyed my time as chairman of ASIC. I'm currently on the board of Fort Ireland. And I've set up a, been involved in setting up a new organization called Association of Visitor Experience and Attractions, ABIA, uh, which has just been launched. And, uh, we will sort out those calls that you talked about, better attractions and more attractions and all of that. We will support the industry on that. And just this is an interesting slide. This is our visitor numbers. Now bear in mind, this happened during the recession. So our market share grew when tourism was in decline. So that meant we got a bigger share of our, our penetration of tourists coming in. The only dip there is 2010, which is the ash cloud. Tourism is access. Access is tourism. We're an island. People need to get to us. And when the ash cloud hit, we, we dropped there. But look at how the numbers kept growing, and I'll tell you why that happened. <coughs> this is an interesting one also, just about where do our visitors come from? 27% for the USA, 26. When we opened for the first five years, that 26 UK used to be 43. 43% UK. But we've grown the other markets. And I, I also think, I might be wrong on this, but I think the UK, there's a lot of repeat business within the UK that come back. 
and you know we're an iconic must see must do attraction so it's kind of like a tip in the box when you've done it you've done it next time you're back or two day you go to some other attraction the one that's growing very nicely for us is uh, Canada but also China we have uh, around 50,000 Chinese visitors every year <coughs> And John mentioned Russia. Fiona, my sales manager, was over in, in Moscow recently as well. I think we have something like 16,000, 17,000 visitors from Russia. And that, that, that will grow. So I really believe the new developing markets, I know they're not going to, it's a slow burner, it's going to take a while, but those markets are going to grow into Ireland and they're going to grow over the time. And we should embrace and we should support our tourism agencies, uh, particularly tourism. Uh, because that, that they, they are going to grow, and we, we see that happening. One of the key things about our success is uh, delivering great customer service, and we really genuinely focus on that on a daily basis. And I joked about, yes, we have no bananas, but the other thing we say is the word no is banned. You know, the word no doesn't exist, really. We try very hard not to do that. And also, when we have seven or 8,000 visitors on a busy Saturday, you know, I say to the staff always, you know, try and approach the visitor before they approach you. So the visitors walk around looking lost. Get to him, get to her, find out what, how you can help and all of that. And uh, also, I attend all inductions. All new staff that come on board have to listen to my mantra uh, for about uh, five minutes, and it's all about this, about customer service. I won't talk about anything else, because I think that's what drives it. And actually, as a brand Guinness, that's what we want. We want people to feel closer to the brand. We want them to feel welcome when they come to the home of Guinness. So our success is our people. Uh, we recruit from the hospitality sector. We didn't when we opened first. We went to universities because we had criteria like languages and things built in. And it then forced us down the road to getting uh, a lot of university graduates. And we learned the hard way that you know, you're better off to you know, recruit the attitude, train the skill, the old adage. And that really worked for us, you know, getting people who wanted to smile, who wanted to work in this wonderful industry, rather than people who might not necessarily want to be in the industry. We conduct great engagement with our staff and we take it very seriously. So our staff tell us what they think of us and the business and their salaries and all that sort of stuff. So we then go back to the staff and say, this is what you told us. We listened, and this is what we're going to do about it. And it really, really works, and there's a lot of trust. I think there's about 10 unions on, on St. James's Gate or something like that. We don't have any unions in, in the Guinness Storehouse. We don't need that, because we are honest and engaging with our staff, and we, we, we uh, fix things. I'm looking at the traffic system over there. And, and then the other thing is we make sure we develop people, um, because there's only one Guinness Storehouse at the moment. Um, and so therefore, where do people go? You know, up, as they go up the higher part of the pyramid. So we created beer specialist roles, and we have 10 of these, and these are two of them, and they're fantastic. They know everything there is to know about beer. And the, with the, with the, give you an idea, with the craft brew growth and all that out there, these people are being headhunted all the time, constantly, and we've never lost one. We pay above, we value them, and we keep uh, developing them, and they go around the world uh, talking about Guinness. They're ambassadors. They love their job. I mean, they go tr literally traveling all over, speaking about Guinness and pouring it and serving it and all of that. Um, this is our net promotional score. And uh, you can see it here. It's from 2011. So over 85% on average, we've taken, of people would recommend the Guinness Storehouse. And that's really high. And the bottom one down is likely and all of that. So if you put the two together, it's a really strong. And this has taken. We do Red Sea research every single quarter, and we do you know, thousands of visitors. So it's an extremely uh, accurate, and, and you can see the average across it. And the red line I just want to share with you is our kind of our employee satisfaction. And I think there's a correlation between what your visitors say about you and what your staff say. You can't have one without the other. You can't treat staff poorly or accommodation or staff food or uniforms or salary, whatever it may be, and expect them to go on stage and engage with the visitor and all that, because it won't happen. The body language will, will, will deceive them and they just won't be able to do it. And I think there's a strong <coughs> correlation between the two. The other thing we've done over the years is that we've created more experience. So we looked at our assets and said, what are the things that we can dial up more to generate welcome surprises for our visitors when they come in, the things that they don't expect? 
So when they pay their <coughs> fee to come in, their, their entrance fee, you know, they know they're going to get a tour, they know they're, they're going to get a pint of Guinness, but we have a multitude of stuff that they don't know that's overlaid on it. So for example, pouring your own pint with a certificate, and uh, you know, you can then send it there and then. We provide the computer terms for send it to their friends around the world. And we have all sorts of different variants of Guinness. I don't know if you know, but Guinness does have other variants, and Hot House 13 would be a great example of a recent innovation that's just gone global. But we have other variants, and we share all those with our visitors in addition to that. And then we have entertainment on in, in our big uh, Arrow suite on a daily basis. So you see the guy on the right hand side come holding up. He's would have an audience of about three or four hundred every time. And then there's Irish dancing or there's food or canopies being served that people didn't expect uh, throughout the building. So it's around giving that bit extra and more to people that they didn't expect and creating more experiences. The other, uh, we've dedicated a whole fifth floor to food and Guinness and food. And I know Paula Keneal is going to speak uh, at least this afternoon and no better man to talk about it. And, you know, he was uh, also very much given us guidance as well. But one of the things we've done is dialed up the whole Guinness and food. Guinness with food and Guinness uh, served and drinking with food. Um, 1837 is a new restaurant we created on the fifth floor. That was the first time Guinness and food was mentioned by Benjamin Disraeli. He mentioned oysters and Guinness in 1837. And we call the restaurant after. So we've really worked hard on, you know, local menus, local ingredients, and, and the staff being able to explain, you know, where the mussels came from, where the lamb came from, all of that. So that there's a whole story and a conversation around the food, and it's constant. You know, you've got to do it every day, and you've got to make sure that the, the staff get it and they understand all of that. <coughs> but Guinness and food is now actually being used by the global brand. Uh, as a platform to grow in the sales globally, such, such the popularity of that is. Events, uh, for example, we have St. Patrick's four-day event in the Guinness stores where we have TVs and radio stations. And again, here's an example of where we give back more than we take. So we have about 40,000 people over the four days, and uh, I spend roughly about 300,000 on this event for the four days, on entertainment, on food, um, and amazing uh, delivery of service that the visitors didn't expect. So we more or less just break even over the four days. But that generates all the publicity for the rest of the year and the noise that we get from that. We get about a half a, I think we get around a half a billion media impressions from this, this event alone. So events are really crucial. This is how we used to connect digitally. Visitors used, used to write a postcard and say how they felt about Guinness and they put the postcard up on the wall and say how they felt. This is how we do it now. We connect digitally with our visitors. I think this is the most checked in Facebook um, place in Ireland. It's a massive big Facebook wall, but it's a great opportunity for people to say how they're feeling about Guinness and sending it around the world to their friends. And uh, there's a lady in the audience here, Valentina Dooley. Valentina, put your hand up so everybody sees you. Valentina was our very first marketing manager. Uh, no, sorry, second marketing manager. She joined us just when digital marketing started to get popular, and Valentina said to me, well, uh, Paul, we're going to spend 25% of the marketing budget on digital. <coughs> and I'm a, from the baby boomer era, I was scared of that figure and all of that, but Valentina set us up for success with, um, with our whole approach to digital marketing, and we've retained that culture, and uh, our expenditure has gone up to 35% of our budget that was into digital marketing. And I think we do it very, very well, and we've lots of we've wonderful opportunities to do it. We've got great moments where people can share on the social platforms. So we, we engage with our visitors before they arrive on social media, while they're with us, and particularly after they after they leave with us, and that's crucially important. And one of the things we're doing a lot late, lately is live Facebook with our staff. And here you see two members of our staff talking about. Guinness Foreign Extra Stout, the Guinness I talked to you about from Africa. But the live, and our archivist Evelyn went on recently and did a live Facebook um, about some of the ar archives of material that we have. International PR is crucial to us. That's what we believe. We, we, that's where we generate all the noise and, and the advertising for the Guinness store. So for example here, if you look at this one, Jock, our chef, uh, went over with Bentleys in London and worked with uh, Corrigan and uh, again he also went over to Canada 
with uh, Fall Charlie and uh, Tourism Ireland did a fantastic promotion with Claude and McKenna. But the reason we did that is because Canada is a growing segment for us. So what better way to do it than through the platform of food and talking about it? And it just attracts loads of attention. And here on the right hand side you see Jock again, and he's talking about food, and he gets onto USA and he gets onto Fox News and all that. I guarantee you the Guinness brand would not be able to do that. It just We're a soft platform. We can talk about things that the brands can't talk about in that manner. The other thing we do a lot of recently is um, Humans of Dublin, for example. So here we had two pensioners talking about their time in Guinness. Really emotional engagement, telling about their great experience with the company and their bad experiences, whatever they want to talk about. Uh, and we also have an employee, this is Dara, who's a local Liberties lad. Uh, talking about his time in the Guinness store and what it's done for him and how he's developed. And then two visitors who happen to walk in who are from Dublin and talking about what do they expect and how do they find it and how are the staff and all that. But that's the sort of thing, the videos that people are looking at and, the, and there's a huge emotional connection. And what it does, it dials up the soul of our brand, what we are and who we are. As Arthur Guinness was a very giving man, a very supportive man to the community and all of that. And we like to feel that we carry that through. One of the greatest successes we had this year was we did a promotion with Airbnb. So this is next generation marketing, they call it at its best, where you work with partners and dial up great partnerships. So we did this with Tourism Ireland and Airbnb. And we did a competition for one lucky couple. We'd fly them from anywhere around the world and they could stay overnight in the gravity bar. We made it into a penthouse suite. The bed you see there was specially designed in the shape of a pint. The chef cooked them a seven-course dinner at night time up in the gravity bar. They, they, said they made a brew that went internationally the next morning, and they just loved it. We had 44,000 entries. I think it says 40,000. It was 44,000 entries, and we generated one billion media impressions for the Guinness Store House. That is great talkability and great recognition. It was the best thing that we've ever done and a fantastic outcome from it. So what I'm suggesting here that you think about is great partnerships with like-minded brands or companies that can work with you, so long as there's a mutual benefit for everybody. There has to be a win-win situation. And winning awards, it's on red now, Olivia, so I'm going to speed up. Winning awards is very, very important. And it's not to be arrogant or it's not a competitive thing. Winning awards is crucial. You target awards. I know there's lots of them out there at the moment, but pick the ones you want to enter into and go for them because it's good for the company, it's good for the brand, and good for the staff to feel they're part of a winning formula and all of that. So I think it's crucial to stay number one and to win awards um, and staying relevant. All of these sections here, I, I won't go into detail, but since we've opened, we've spent a further 28 million on developing it, and every one of those, like our retail, the tasting rooms, uh, the connoisseur bar, and the academy, you know, they're all new, and the reason we created those is our visitors told us that this is what we like what you do, but can you do more of this? So our capital investment was listened to, was, was dictated by the visitor, and we're constantly keeping it fresh and, and reinventing, and I'm very lucky and very fortunate that the, the companies support that investment. And there's an example of a brewing floor that we just finished this year. We spent 1.2 million on that floor, and it's just gorgeous. It's a huge improvement of what was there. So, to the future, to wind up, um, we have one gravity bar. So, to Mark's point about capacity and people, quite right, there is a pinch point up there. Everybody goes up there. So, we're building a new gravity bar, um, and it's going to cost 1.3 million. Uh, and it's going to be fantastic. We'll be from one into the other. <coughs> and it's badly needed because everybody goes there. That's, that's part of the, the, I don't know, the most iconic part of the visit. And the good news also is that Guinness themselves are developing the site up in St. James' Gate. So there's 12 acres up for grabs as we speak, and we're talking to uh, developers to develop the site, to make it into a really a stylish urban quarter, and you, you, where the storehouse is, you'll be able to come up there in five, six years' time, yeah. and there'll be all sorts of restaurants, bars, uh, comedy in that area. There'll be no security, because brewing is going down by Houston Station, thank God, and all of our area will be much more open for the public to come in and access. 
So the future looks good, and we hope to have that ready by May of 2019. Let's take it forward a little bit. So that's it. Thank you very much.